It can be easy to think that you're better than other people. It can, <laughs> it can be easy to think that God owes you something for how good you are. Of course, I think you already know the truth is that that's not the case. The Bible tells us from beginning to end that God's blessings to us are by grace. It's because of God's undeserved love. That's what we'll hear about in our service today. If you open up to page 4 or look up on the screen, you see the verse of the day is from Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. Let's read those words together. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. And so for us who find it easy to get a big head or to look down on others, today we're reminded that it's all by God's grace, God's undeserved love to us in Jesus. Start by singing our opening song, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. 
But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with His innocent suffering and death. Trusting in Him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Pause for a moment to silence. Speech privately confess our sins to God. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. My gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stay standing as we sing our, our next song, Salvation Unto Us Has Come. <laughs> His undeserved love for us. Our first lesson comes from the book of Jonah in the Old Testament, chapters 3 and 4. When you hear about the prophet Jonah, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? The whale, the big fish. Jonah's the prophet who got swallowed by the big fish. That's what's well known about Jonah. What's not so well known is what actually happens when Jonah goes to Nineveh, where he was trying not to go, when he actually goes there and preaches God's word. Something really surprising happens. The people believe him. Surprising because this doesn't happen often to God's prophets in the Bible. Jonah goes to Nineveh, he preaches God's word, and all the people repent. And do you know how Jonah felt? Angry. Do you know why? He didn't like the people in Nineveh. He didn't want the people in Nineveh to be saved, and so when he preached God's word to them and they repented and God forgave them, Jonah was angry. And here we have an interaction between Jonah and God in which Jonah the prophet is upset at God for his grace. And God telling Jonah, no Jonah, of course, of course I want even the people in wicked Nineveh to be saved. When God saw what they had done and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But God replied, Is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. 
And the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, it sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals. This is God's word. What's surprising is that's how the book of Jonah ends. Isn't that kind of surprising? It ends with this great city that was wicked being saved from God's wrath because they repented. And Jonah the prophet, who you'd expect to be in in the right place, right? Is angry at God for his grace. So it's hard to think of a more powerful story in the Bible that contrasts our pride and self-righteousness with the grace of God who saves sinners out of his, his undeserved love for them. The next lesson from God's Word is from the New Testament, from the book of Romans chapter 9. Here the Apostle Paul uses examples from history, from the history of Israel, to show that God's grace is always just a result of his mercy, not a result of what people do. It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, not beca- nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this is how the promise was stated, at the appointed time I will return and Sarah will have a son. Not only that, but Rebekah's children were conceived at the same time by her father Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose and election might stand, Not by works, but by him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. Just as is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? Not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. It does not, therefore, depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. This is God's word. Before we move on, I just want to make sure we understand the examples that Paul gives. He gives the example of Abraham. And if you ask, why did God choose Abraham and his family of all the people on earth to be his special people, what would be the answer? Why did God choose Abraham? By grace. By his mercy. Completely by his mercy. God gives the example about how Rebekah... Abraham's daughter-in-law had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. And Jacob was the one the promise of the Savior went through and not Esau. Why was it that God chose to have the promise go through Jacob and not Esau? Just by grace. Just by his mercy. And Paul uses this as a powerful example of God's blessings to us. It's, It's not a result of the works that we do. It's all tied to God's mercy. Sing about that in our next song. Our next song is kind of special. You might not think so when I tell you why. But it's special. This is a song that's actually written by a Wells Luther. You maybe realize almost all of the songs in our hymnal are written by other Christians and we thank God for them. There's just a, a very few, just a couple hymns that are actually written by someone who's a Wells Luther. And this is one of them. So if you haven't heard it before, maybe that's why. But it's a beautiful song emphasizing God's grace, not unto us. And during the last verse, I invite the kids to come up for our children's devotion.
say something that might sound a little strange, but I want you to try to think about what it means. I once heard someone say that heaven, you know heaven is, right? Where God is, where we're going to go someday. The person said heaven is flat. You ever heard that before? Heaven is flat. Do you know what it means if something's flat? Like it's just flat, like the floor in the church, right? It doesn't have any mountains or valleys. It's just flat. This person says that heaven is flat. Do you know why somebody would say that heaven is flat? What the person meant to say was that in heaven, everybody is equal. Now here on earth, I don't think we would say that it's flat. Do you know why? Because people like to think that they're better than other people. Does that ever happen? And when you think that you're better than other people, what do you kind of do to them? Which direction do you look? You look down on them. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's easy to think, well, I'm pretty special, and you kind of stand up straight, and then you look at that person over there, and you're kind of like you look down on them. But heaven is flat, and that in heaven, nobody can look down on anybody else. Do you know why? All the people in heaven realize something about themselves. What are we all equal in? We're all sinful. Are there some people who are worse than other people, according to God? No. Are there some people who are way better than other people, according to God? No, heaven is flat. Do you understand that? Nobody in heaven looks down on other people and says, oh, I'm better than them. 
But it's not just because we're all sinful that heaven's flat. It's because God loves us by grace. Do you know what the word grace means? Undeserved love. And so God in heaven, he loves everybody exactly the same way. So if heaven is flat and that people don't look down on other people and everybody trusts in God's grace, what should we do as Christians here in this world? Should we think that we're better than other, everybody else? No, we should remember, all of us have this in common. We're all sinful people who are saved by the grace of God. And do, do you know what happens in your life when you stop looking down on other people? Do you know what happens? You can make more friends. You can care for more people. You can show God's love to more people when at school or with your friends. It seems like some people think they're up here and other people are down here. Remember this. Heaven is flat. To God, we're all sinners and we're all loved and saved by God's grace. Let's say a prayer about that. Can you fold your hands and bow your heads? Dear Jesus, sometimes we think that we're better than other people. Sometimes we can look down on other people. You tell us in your word, Lord, that that's not how it works. That we're all sinful and at the same time we're all loved by your grace. Thank you for loving us. And instead of looking down on other people, help us to love them too. Remind us that heaven is flat. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up here today. You can go back to your seats. The sermon today is taken from our gospel lesson, which is from the gospel of Matthew chapter 20. Please stand as we hear words from Jesus in our gospel lesson. Our lesson today is Jesus telling us a, a parable, a story. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon, and about three in the afternoon, and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who came, who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first. And the first will be last. This is God's word. You may be seated. Dear friends in Jesus, God's not fair. Do you ever hear people say that? Do you ever think that to yourself? God's not fair. I think that's a pretty popular thought. When the wrong people seem to succeed, God's not fair. When our plans don't work out just the way that we want them to work out, God's not fair. When you don't get the recognition that you feel you deserve for what you do, God's not fair. 
Or maybe it's when tragedy or sickness or death strikes you or someone in your family. God's not fair. Do you people say that? You thought that yourself? Here's what the Bible would say. Of course he's not. Does that sound surprising? Of course God's not fair. Just think about it. What if God were to give us what we really deserve? How would that go? Well, what do we deserve? The Bible tells us that we deserve punishment for our sin, right? The Bible even says that just one sin deserves condemnation in hell. So what if today God were to give us all what we really deserve? We'd be toast, right? Instead, God is gracious. Remember what grace means? I just talked about it with the kids. Grace is God's undeserved love. God is not fair. He doesn't give us what we deserve. He's better than that. He's gracious. Now, as I said, I have to clarify something. Of course, God is perfect. He's absolutely perfect. And since God is absolutely perfect, of course God is perfectly just and God is perfectly fair. Right? Paul in our second lesson, he said, God is not unfair. But this is what we're talking about today. God's sense of fairness is different than our sense of fairness. God's sense of justice is different than our sense of justice. Things in the kingdom of heaven work differently than things in our kingdoms here on earth. And so to teach us about the kingdom of heaven, Jesus would tell parables, stories, like the one we have today. To teach us about fairness in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them each a denarius, and he sent them into his vineyard. Sounds simple enough. This landowner needs workers for his vineyard. He agrees to pay him each a denarius. A denarius was one day's wage. There was a coin that was one day's wage. That sounds simple enough. It's just you have to, to know this. What this landowner did was a huge blessing for these workers. In ancient times, in Jesus' day, to be a day laborer, to be a, a worker, was a really bad position to be in. There were no unions. There were no strikes. There were no benefits. If you were a day laborer, you depended on the goodwill of a landowner to give you a job and to pay you for it. And for this landowner to, to give the opportunity to these workers to work in his vineyard, this was a, a blessing to those workers. But the landowner didn't stop there. Knowing that this was a lifesaver to these workers to give them a job, the, the landowner goes out again and again hiring more workers. Did you, did you count how many times he goes out? Five different times. Five times. Now you can't tell me that he actually needed more workers five times during the day. Right? There's no way. Why did he do this? Because he was generous. Because he was gracious. He knew how much these workers needed. So at nine o'clock he goes out again. He says, you don't have a job? Come work for me. 12 o'clock, he goes out again. You're still sitting around? Come work for me. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he goes out again. Nobody's paying you today. Come and work for me. This landowner is so generous, it's almost ridiculous because the last time he goes out, it was the 11th hour, which was 5 o'clock. The workday ended at 6 o'clock. Who goes out and hires workers for one hour at the end of the day? Nobody does except this Landowner, he goes to the marketplace one more time and he says to the men there, why are you still here standing around all day long? And they said, because no one has hired us. And so he said, go work in my vineyard. As you hear Jesus tell the story, hopefully you notice that the focus of the story is not on the workers. It's on this landowner. This kind man who spends his whole day looking for opportunities to invite workers to work in his vineyard. And finally, the, the 12th hour came. Six o'clock, the day's done. So it's pay time. If you've been paying attention to the story, you'd think this, this should be pretty complicated. How is he going to pay all of these different workers who have worked different lengths during the day? Well, he decides to start with those who, who work the least amount. 
And so the ones who had started work at five in the afternoon came forward, and each of them received a denarius. And now this must have been shocking. They worked for one hour. That means they worked for one twelfth of the day. And yet he paid them a denarius. How much was a denarius worth? A whole day's wage. It was way more than what they deserved. Can you picture the smiles on these men's faces? Right? Each worker came forward and each of them got a denarius. And so finally, it came to the, the first ones. They were the ones who'd actually worked a full day. Of course, they'd been watching. They saw the smiles on all the other workers' faces. They saw this generous wage that the landowner gave to everybody else. And they were the ones who had worked the hardest and the longest all day long, a full day's work. And what do you think they were thinking? Oh, we're going to get more, right? We better get more. We deserve more. And were they right? Well, of course, the way that we look at things, they were absolutely right. If I work for 12 hours and you work for one hour, I better get paid more than you do, right? Right? That's what's fair. That's what's just. Except what did each of those first workers get paid? Same amount. A denarius. And they didn't smile. They grumbled against the landowner. They said, these last workers have worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. This is not fair. We deserve more. But the landowner said, I am not being unfair with you, friend. Did you not agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give to the one who worked one hour the same that I give to you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? This landowner wasn't being unfair he gave the workers exactly what they had agreed to work for one denarius for one day's work. If there was anything that was unfair, it was his generosity. But didn't he have the right to do what he wanted to with his own money? So Jesus ended with this. The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. So what do you think Jesus is teaching us? We said that he's teaching us about the kingdom of heaven and how in God's kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven, things work differently than in our kingdom here on earth. In God's kingdom, is it a matter of our works or God's grace? God's grace. Like what percent? What percent of it depends on God's grace? 100%. All of it, you see, in our kingdom... We're used to everything depending on our hard work. In God's kingdom, God says it all depends on his grace. This is why I told the kids that heaven is flat. Once people get to heaven, it's all equal, right? We're all the same, same in sin, same in being saved by God's grace to us in Jesus. But when you hear that, isn't it awful? This is probably one of the most disturbing things that the Bible tells us about God. God's grace. God's generosity. This is probably one of the hardest things in the whole Bible for people to accept. Do you know what? If you're saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus, you are not better than anybody else. Do you like to hear that? If you are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus, that means that God's blessings to you in your life are not something that you earned. If you are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus, that means that whatever there is in your life that's good, 100% of the credit goes to God. If you're saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus, that means that it's, it's not by your own works. There's a verse in the Bible that says, if by grace, then it's no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Romans 11, verse 6. You know what? 
We don't like this. Maybe I should say it like this. Our sinful natures don't like this. Just think about the thoughts that come into our minds. Maybe some of you have this thought that comes into my mind. I, I've been a Christian my whole life. Not like these newbies over here. If you're a member of our church, maybe, maybe this thought has come into your mind. I'm, I'm not just a Christian. I'm even a Lutheran. And on top of that, I am a, a Wells Lutheran. Right? It's got to be worth something. Right? Or how about this? I, I try my hardest. And they don't. I put in my fair share. Not like those people. When those thoughts come into our hearts and into our minds, whom are we thinking like? Those first workers in the story who grumbled against the landowner were grumbling against God. We're, we're grumbling against God's grace. And I want you to see that we have some sinful, sinful assumptions behind those complaints. And they go like this. I deserve more from God than that person does. Or God owes me because of what I've done for him. Can you hear a problem with that? I think as you hear Jesus' parable, there's two things that we need to confess. We need to confess that we think that we merit good things from God based on what we do. And then because of that, we, we look down on other people and, and when we do that, we, we despise God's grace. And so here's a test. Here's one question to test our understanding of God's grace. Can a murderer make it into heaven? I actually have people ask me that pretty commonly. And usually they phrase it like this. Pastor, a murderer can't make it into heaven, right? I mean, we've got to draw the line somewhere, right? I mean, there's some people who just don't deserve to get there. If ever we, we think that, what are we implying? We deserve to get there. And we think that we deserve to get there. What are we basing our confidence and our trust on? Ourselves and our works. But remember, that's not how it works in the kingdom of heaven. In the kingdom of heaven, it's by God's grace. Can a murderer get to heaven? What's the answer? Of course. How? The same way that anybody's going to make it to heaven. Which is by repenting of our sins and trusting in God's grace to us in Jesus. But you say they don't deserve it. They don't deserve to go there at all. Of course they don't deserve it. That's the whole point. God gives people what we don't deserve. God's not fair. He's so much better. He's gracious. Instead of punishing us for our sins, God sent his own son Jesus. Instead of putting us up on a cross like our sins deserve. Jesus died on the cross to win forgiveness for our sins, to win eternal life. God holds out the same promise to everyone. Repent and believe the good news. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Repent and believe the good news. God's not fair, at least not the way that we look at fairness. He's so much better. He's gracious. So here's what that means for us. There's a number of things we could say. First of all, that means that in the kingdom of heaven, there's no room for comparisons. The last will be first and the first will be last. In the kingdom of heaven, there's no room for comparing. I have to admit that's really hard for me. I'm a very competitive person. Are some of you competitive people? And if you're a competitive person, you know what we always do? We always compare. Right? How can I be better than that person? How can I do better than that person? And what Jesus teaches us, there's no room for comparing in the kingdom of heaven. If you think about those first workers and where they went wrong, those first workers went wrong when they took their eyes off of the landowner and they put their eyes on their co-workers. You know what? That never ends up well. It leads to comparing and ranking and pride and envy there's no comparing in the kingdom of heaven. Don't put your eyes on your fellow workers. 
Put your eyes on Jesus and his grace. Here's the second thing this means for us. It's not too late for you. Now, as I've been having this sermon, maybe you can tell most of what I've been saying has referred to the the first workers, the people who've been working the whole time. Maybe for Christians who've been Christians a long time. Maybe there's some people here who you haven't been a Christian your whole life. Maybe you're just coming back to Christianity after a time away. You know what Jesus says to you? It's not too late for you. You know, if you haven't been a Christian your whole life, I can imagine it it might be hard to look around at other Christians and say, that person's believed their whole life. How could I ever be like that? How could I ever do as much as this person has done? Maybe it's too late. Maybe there's not time for, for me to do what I need to do. You know what Jesus says? It's not too late for you. Even if it's the 11th hour. What is Jesus doing? Calling people. He's calling you calling you by His grace to come to His house. Here's the third thing. If you understand God's grace to you, then you'll realize that Christians have more motivation to be the best workers than anybody else. Can you see that? Maybe sometimes people hear this parable or hear Christians talk about grace and how it's not by works and they walk away thinking, ah, that means it doesn't matter what I do in my life. Right? I don't have to do anything at all. It doesn't matter. Hold on. If you understand that God has given you way more than you deserve, if you understand that God has prepared for you in heaven way more than you could possibly deserve, deserve, what does that motivate you to do? To serve God with everything you've got. Christian workers have more motivation to be the best workers possible than anyone else because you know that you're not serving some human being. Whom are you serving? You're serving God. Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Last thing, here's the fourth thing that we can learn. The more that you appreciate God's grace, the more you celebrate God's grace to others. A Christian who recognizes God's grace never comes to church and looks around and says, Oh, she's here today. Or, what's that guy doing here? No way. A Christian who understands God's grace comes to church and looks around and says, Yes, she's back. I'm so happy that he's here. This is what God's angels do. Jesus said that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. When God leads another sinner to repent, the the angels don't get envious. They celebrate. The more that you recognize God's grace to you, the more you'll celebrate seeing God's grace in the lives of other people. Maybe even like this. I, I think I've shared this with some of you before. But think about it like this. How do you think the the people in heaven reacted when the person who murdered murdered them got to heaven too? You know, this has happened in in real history. You think especially of the Apostle Paul? We talked about can a murderer get to heaven. The Apostle Paul was a murderer. And what type of people did Paul murder? Christians. And so can you picture this? The day that Paul, who by Jesus' grace was converted into being a disciple of Jesus, on the day that Paul died and went to heaven, how do you think the Christians in heaven whom Paul had murdered, how do you think they reacted? Hard for us to picture here on earth, but you know how they reacted, right? They celebrated. They said, you made it. You too. By God's grace. Just like me. Don't we have an amazing God? See, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Heaven is flat. Because we have a God who, although he may not always seem to be fair, he's so much more. He's gracious. Amen. Let's say a prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, you are wise to tell us a parable about fairness in the kingdom of heaven. When we look at what you've done and what you still do in the world today, it it often can seem to us like you're not fair. Lord, we ask that you forgive us for all of our complaints and grumbles against you. 
when we really sit back and see the big picture of your promises to us in your word, we see that the only way you're not fair is that you're so gracious. You are so generous to us. Help us to stop trusting in our own works, but to trust in your grace to us. May that lead us to be gracious to others. May that lead us not to compare, but to celebrate the salvation of other people's souls. May that lead us to use our whole lives, our, our time and abilities and talents, to serve you to the best of our abilities. Dear Jesus, to you be all of the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. See, by confessing our faith to God with the words of the Apostles' Creed, we stand to confess our faith again. Living in a world where people believe that the universe was formed through chance and accident, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Living in a world where people are confronted with the guilt and punishment of sin, what do you believe Jesus did for you? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Living in a world where people are without hope and certainty, what do you believe? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Be seated. One way we show our thanks to God for His grace to us is the way that we use our, our, our financial blessings here on earth. I thank you for the offerings you give to our church. You can put them in the box in the back or give online too. We appreciate your support of our ministry. So a few people to, to pray for today. Uh, we have a few prayers of thanksgiving to give. Last Sunday we prayed for two people who were about to have surgery. We prayed for Travis Burmaster, the son of Barry and Lori, and he had a successful heart surgery this last week, so we'll thank God for that. And we prayed for my mom, who had a, a growth removed from her throat, and it turned out to not be cancer, which was great news. And so we'll uh, say a prayer of thanks to God for that, too. And also say a prayer for uh, a member, uh, a neighbor of Dave and Rayleigh Francis. Their, their neighbor fell and was seriously injured at his house recently, so we'll say a prayer also for him. We go to our God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we were reminded today that everything that's good in our lives it ultimately comes from you. And so when good things happen, remind us to come and give you thanks. Last Sunday we prayed for two people who are undergoing surgeries this last week and you blessed both of them. We're thankful for Travis's successful heart surgery. Lord, he still uh, needs to recover and regain some health and strength. But the doctors say that the surgery was a success. We pray that over the coming months, his heart would be able to strengthen, that you'd remove the AFib that he's been having, help him to be able to resume the, the normal activities of his life. I thank you that you blessed my, my mother's surgery. Thank you that the growth that she had was not cancer. Please be with her as she recovers and protect her from cancer in the future too. We thank you for your blessings to both of them. Lord, we pray in a special way for Mel today. Mel's the neighbor of Dave and Rayleigh Francis. Um, in your wisdom, you allowed him to, to fall at his house, and he's been injured and is in surgery today. Lord, we ask that you bless the, the surgery that's taking place right now. We pray, Lord, that they'd be able to, uh, doctors, to the best of their ability, to fix what's wrong in his body. If it's your will, we pray that you spare his life, and you allow him to regain health and strength. Be with both him and his wife. Help them to have trust in you in this difficult time. Pray all this in the name of Jesus who's taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And go with God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. 
So Lord, look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Sing one more song about God's grace and mercy. His mercy is more. Yes.